Okay, in this video, I'm going to begin my derivation of the Fourier transform. I'm going to perform this derivation through a series of three videos. The first two videos will introduce all of the necessary theory required to derive the transform. And a third video will have the derivation of the transform proper. Specifically in this video, number one of three, I'm going to revise the Fourier series. And this is going to be pitched at a person who has seen Fourier series in the past and is just looking to brush up on the, the derivation of the Fourier series and what Fourier series are. Before I continue, I'd like to introduce to you my website, universityphysicstutorials.com. Here I have all my videos archived and listed, and I also have a few other things which may be of interest. So let's begin. So, like I said, in order for us to derive the Fourier transform, we must begin at Fourier series. Joseph Fourier suggested that all 2 pi periodic functions have what's known as a Fourier series. And the Fourier series is of the form written on the bottom of your screen. I think it is useful for us just to read this as a beginning. So let's say we have a function of time, f of t. So the first thing we have in the Fourier series is a constant term, a0. Sometimes this is written as a0 over 2. Now this will just mean that the derivation of a0 will be slightly different, but it won't affect the results at all. We need to add to this the infinite power series, going from n is equal to 1 to infinity, of the coefficient a sub n multiplied by cosine nt, and the coefficient b sub n multiplied by sine nt. So this is what Fourier proposed. He thereafter had to work out or derive the actual functional forms of b sub n, a sub n, and a sub zero. So let's quickly show how he did that. In order to derive the a sub zero term, we multiply the Fourier series here by one and we integrate from minus pi to pi. So I've done that here. Now, well, I haven't really done it, I've more shown how it's done. Note that the, this set of terms here integrates to zero, and this term here integrates to twice pi. Rearranging, we get the functional form of a sub zero down here. Note, by the way, if we had d defined the Fourier series as having a sub zero over two, well then this uh, scaling term would be slightly different. But of course, it would not affect your results. Now it's time to derive the functional form of a sub n. Before we do that, we require some revision. Sine and cosine are said to be orthogonal but in a mathematical rather than a geometrical sense. The definition mathematically of this is written here, whereby we integrate on the interval minus to positive pi, cosine mt by the sine of n or mt, and we get zero. Now, if we integrate the product of cosine mt and cosine nt, on that same interval, we get three different results. When m is not equal to n, we get zero. When m is equal to n and both are equal to zero, we get twice pi. And when m is equal to n and non-zero, we get pi. So this means that this integral pretty much will always be zero unless m equals n, and thereafter this integral becomes essentially the integral of cosine squared, and we get pi. Pretty much the same thing happens when we integrate the product of these signs, where we have m and n here like that. Once again, if it's done correctly, whereby m is equal to n, we integrating sine squared, and we get pi. The last thing we need is this double angle formula here. That is in order to integrate cosine squared and sine squared x. Just quickly, you can, you can look at my video on how to integrate cosine and sine squared x, but essentially what we do is we integrate, we'll say, cos squared plus sine squared, that's equal to one. Cos squared minus sine squared is equal to twice cos x, we'll say. If you add the two of those, 
you get the double angle formula for cosine squared in, t in terms of cosine 2x. And if you then substitute in sine squared is equal to 1 minus cos squared, you are able to get the formula I've written on the bottom of your screen. Just bear with me one moment now and we, we move on. We now have all the machinery we require in order to derive the a sub n's. In order to do this, we multiply the Fourier series across by cosine m r. So m not equal to n, and we integrate this on minus to positive pi. So I've written that Fourier series here. Now I'm not going to perform the integrals because we've already seen that when we integrate the product of a cosine and a sine like this, that is going to integrate to zero. And when we integrate this particular cosine here, it's also going to go to zero. So we're simply left with the summation outside of the integral of the product of cosines. But as we saw a moment ago, this is essentially no good to us unless m is equal to n and non-zero. So let's assume that that is the case. How do, we, how do we find out that the integral of cosine squared is in fact pi? Now there are many different ways of doing this. Well, there are mainly two different ways of doing this. I've done one uh, a different way on my video of integrating cosine and sine squared. Here what I've done actually is I've started with cosine squared and I've plugged in 1 minus sine squared. And then I inserted the double angle formula up here which I discussed earlier on. And if you plug that in, which is pretty straightforward, you're able to integrate the cosine squared because we have, we go from 1 minus sine squared here to this particular formula here. And once we're careful with our limits, we see that cosine squared integrates to pi. If we rearrange this, we are able to find out the functional form of our a sub m or a sub n, it doesn't really matter. So we find out that a sub m is equal to 1 over pi, the integral from minus pi to pi of f of r times cosine m r. Now, there is something which I, I didn't mention, I probably should have mentioned it. I'm using a dummy variable here. Let, I'm using r inside these integrals. And you might ask, why am I doing that? Well, it, it doesn't really become clear until you derive the Fourier transform. Without the, this dummy variable, you cannot derive the Fourier transform and it is simply good practice to use a dummy variable inside such integrals. So that is how we derive the a sub n's or the a sub, a sub m's, whichever you, you prefer. Now in order to do the b sub n's, we do something similar. We, I'm not going to do it in the same detail. And we multiply across by sine m r and we integrate on the same integral minus pi to pi. This is going to result in a sine squared which we know integrates to pi along that, that particular interval. And we get that b sub m is equal to 1 over pi, the integral of f of r sine of m r dr. So it's very similar to the a sub m's, or the a sub n's. Just to remind you again, because I think it's important, or just to stress it, the r is nothing but a dummy variable instead of t, which we use inside the integrals, as it is in fact good practice. So summing up, we get the following, that the Fourier transform of our function of t is as we wrote at the start, and we're after now getting the functional form of a sub 0, a sub n, and b sub n. Before we move on, we must note that the coefficients are in fact transforming a function of t, although I am using a dummy variable of r, into a function of m. Well, you might wonder, how, how is that actually happening? Well, look, we're integrating out r here when we go to, we'll say, a sub 0, the, the constant. We're integrating out r here when we go to a sub n. And we're integrating out r here when we go to b sub n. So we are transforming from r to n. Or from, actually, what's really happening is you're transforming from t to n. So we're already seeing that we're using the, the Fourier series is in fact involving a transform. And what's happening is we're rewriting our, fu our, fu our function in terms of cosines and sines. 
Now I'll discuss the physical significance of this much more in further videos. Now I'd like to extend the concept of Fourier series from 2 pi periodic functions to 2 L periodic functions. And this really only amounts to a change of scale. Let's suggest we have a function g of alpha and it's defined exactly as we had earlier on for a 2 pi periodic function. The next thing we're going to do is a change of scale and this really amounts to a sleight of hand. And if you wonder how this in fact works, I'm sure if you sit, just sit back, absorb it, you'll see in fact that this is a clever way of doing this change of scale and going from twice pi to twice L periodic functions. Let's say that our alpha is equal to pi times t over L. That, in other words, that t is L times alpha over pi. Let's substitute that into our function g of alpha. And plugging in thereafter, we get our new Fourier series for our twice L periodic function. What's important to note here is that we now have our period, or half our period in fact, in front of the A sub n, the B sub n, and, and the full period in front of A sub 0. And we talk about having the argument of our cosine as n pi r over L. What's interesting here is we are already introducing the concept of the frequency domain because the argument of cosine and sine and all these must be dimensionless. So, well, n pi of course is dimensionless, so let's just ignore n pi for the moment. But r is not dimensionless. Let's say, in fact, we actually had t. Just say we had t for the moment, where we're in the time domain. If we're in the time domain, well then of course the units on time are the second, or the unit on time is the second. In order for us to have a dimensionless argument of cosine, we need to divide by something whose unit is per second, or hertz in this particular case. So that means L has units of per second. Now let's say in fact we didn't have T, but rather we had X. We would have X measured, let's say, in meters. It would mean that L would have to be measured in per meters. So L would be our spatial frequency. So we are already talking about the frequency domain. Furthermore, what we're actually doing here is writing our function in terms of cosines and sines. So we're using cosine and sine as our basis functions. Now what does this mean? Well, if we're talking about the normal Cartesian coordinates, we can talk about i hat, we can talk about j hat and k hat in order to describe every point in three dimensional space. But if you want to talk about, let's say, spherical polar coordinates, you might talk about r hat, theta hat, and phi hat. But these unit vectors will describe every point that the first unit vectors would do. Similarly, if you introduce the cylindrical coordinates, you would see that in, in fact these would also do the exact same job. So we're using different bases to describe the same points in space. But the different bases have different properties which makes the mathematics simpler. So what the Fourier series is doing is changing the basis from whatever it was at the start to now using functions instead of vectors to describe the uh, the, the space. So we're using cosines and sines as our basis functions instead of having basis vectors. So the Fourier series is already introducing the concept of the frequency domain and a change of basis. If this is something which is new to you, don't worry, it's something I will discuss in greater depth when we're deriving the Fourier transform proper. The next thing I'd like to discuss is the concept of oddness and evenness. This is very important. Cosine is an even function because it satisfies this particular expression. Sine is an odd function because it satisfies this particular expression. How do we use that in the study of Fourier series? Well, just to suggest what a 
odd function and an even function would look like graphically, we see here that an even function is symmetric around the y-axis, where we see that an odd function is symmetric around the origin. If we then look at the product of, or the products of odd and even functions, we see the product of two even functions is even, the product of two odd functions is even, and the product of an odd function and an even function is odd. Why is this, why is this important? If we go back to the definition of our a sub n's and our b sub n's, we see that we're multiplying our input function, let's say f of r, using our dummy variable, multiplied by either a cosine or a sine. What this means is that where our, we'll say where our f of r is even, we see the integral is going to be non-zero. And the reason that is, is that even functions don't integrate to zero, excuse me, don't integrate to zero on an even interval. However, the odd functions, odd functions do integrate to zero on an even integral. So what that means is that where f of r is odd, the integral itself for a sub n is going to be equal to zero. Similarly, where f of r is even, the b sub n's are going to be equal to zero, and f of r is odd, the b sub n's are going to be non-zero. This means that if you look at f of r, your input function, if it happens to be even or odd, you can either use the, you can use the a sub n's or the b sub n's where applicable and ignore essentially half of the computation. So if f of r is even or f of t is even, we only have even or cosine terms. If f of r is odd, we only have odd or sine terms. And what we speak of is Fourier cosine or sine series. So that's all I've got to say about the Fourier series for the moment. I will absolutely be expanding on it in the coming videos. So thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. And I might also check out universityphysicstutorials.com.